Okay, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, it's my first time uh, I'm speaking on any conference, so please, uh, I'm sorry for all the mistakes I'm going to make. Um, hopefully there will be not that many. Um, all right, so I came here to, today to San Francisco to uh, tell you a bit about the Membrane Framework, which is uh, a framework I created uh, with my team for Elixir, and its primary purpose is to do uh, multimedia streaming. It's not a domain that is normally associated with, uh, with Elixir or any high-level languages. Normally, when you think multimedia, you think something low-level, so it has to be performant. But what we have found out is that uh, there are plenty of use cases where you would like to embed some um, multimedia transformation into your application uh, without escaping the domain of Elixir that you probably use for core of your app. That was the case uh, in the in the product I was building. Um, um, I'll tell some details maybe later, but maybe um, maybe a few things how I got to this point. Um, as was mentioned um, uh, by the host, I used to work in media. Uh, beyond my uh, long-term interest uh, and engagement in IT, and I used to work in media for many years. I used to work in so-called legacy media it, that still exists. Um, and um, and I used to, I spent a fair amount of time in TV, uh, and that was Polish national TV. Uh, and in Europe, the, the the state television has much higher importance than here. And then I spent quite a lot of time in radio, and I founded a radio station that, that was kind of a cult radio station in the city where I live. And um, after that, that journey started, because that was kind of a journey that wasn't uh, a plan for life for me. Uh, I decided to merge all, this, all those two areas. I, I had both the, enough experience in IT to understand how old school is the approach to, to, the, to the hardware and software in media and how to do this better. So I founded a company called RadioKid. Uh, it was supposed to uh, make a, a SaaS platform for radio stations. Essentially, the idea was that if, if you have this, uh, you, you can imagine this studio in the radio where you have a mixer like, like this, but, but bigger. You can replace all that with a piece of software. So you can stream to the cloud, you can mix all this in the cloud, you can make like tons of setups and configurations, and all that obviously real-time, low latency. Uh, it has to work 24-7 because if it doesn't work, the radio doesn't broadcast, and so on and so on. And then Elixir was something super fresh, uh, but I decided to give it a try. The, the radio kit is still operating, it's not evolving, it's kind of a frozen project, but there are multiple radio stations uh, broadcasting both online and in the FM and DAB+, which is also terrestrial radio, but uh, digital. Um, but the company itself was kind of acquired by Software Mention, which is a consulti, co consultancy uh, based in Poland, where, which hires almost 50 developers, and we serve mostly startups from San Francisco and New York. So um, so we still do a lot of Elixir work, but we decided to take what was the, the core, the, the engine of the, of the radio kit, uh, extract it, prepare it for, for, for being more flexible, so you can do much more than just simple audio streaming, and this is Membrane. Uh, <coughs> Membrane was released more than a year ago, but it's in production for, I think, two years already. It's still evolving, uh, it's still young. There are many features I'm going to talk about that are still not implemented fully or they still need some tweaking, but generally speaking, what is the problem with multimedia streaming and why we have decided to, to make another framework for that? Um, and the problem with, the, with multimedia is that if you have the simple possible example, you have a hello world of multimedia streaming. So you take some stream that, let's say, it contains a, a song. It's an mp3 file with a song. You want to decode it. So you can encode it again, let's say, with lower bitrate, because, I don't know, you want to keep it on a mobile device which has limited storage. And then you want to output it somewhere, so like store it or send it somewhere. It looks pretty simple. And if you are not into multimedia, you might have imagination that it is simple. But it's not. Like, the problem with multimedia is that there is 
like if you have in, in, in let's say general development, general de software development, you have areas you can split like front and back end, and you can be a front end developer not really understanding what happens in the back end. Obviously, I I don't appreciate that, but you know this is how work works. Uh, you can't really do this with 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 multimedia. You have to be full stack from day one. It's it's really hard. Why? If we take such simple pipeline like this. Uh, what can go wrong? First of all, any of these elements can, can have lower throughput than the others. Okay? We have to implement sort of back pressure. But this is this is trivial, right? But the decoder may fail. Fail totally or partially because the, the data that comes to it may be malformed. This is especially important if you uh, capture the the, the the stream from the net and, and there may be some lags or something like that. Uh, the, the the data stream can be enriched by some metadata, and obviously there are tons of formats. Like, forget about standards here. If you take any uh, documentation for any metadata uh, uh, standard, you you will have to open a beer like immediately. Like you you know you you can't handle the sober. Like, uh, and obviously the the you have plenty of implementations that are not always working according to the documentation and so on. Only in MP3, MP, MP you have like five ways to embed uh, tags, and obviously they are incompatible, and it's, it's, it's awful. The input stream can be possibly interleaved by different things that are related to the transport layer. So forget about everything you learned in the computer science uh, classes, uh, university, that you have to split certain things. You know, Forget about this. If you have the simple possible example, uh, like internet radio, uh, in the internet radio, the stream is uh, split into chunks, and these chunks have uh, 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 length that is not aligned with the sound frames. And in these holes between, you can have a metadata, which is different metadata, if we have the same file, but not as a stream, but as a, but as a file. So you can quickly get into situations where transport layer kind of affects the, how the data is encoded. And it, it's, I'm talking about you know, MP3 file. Don't ask me about video. Uh, so it's not all that. The decoder can output different formats, because obviously if you have a raw, so-called raw audio or raw video, the, the, un the undecoded one, the obviously there are plenty of ways how to store it in memory. And you might end up with uh, having this uh, signed 16-bit uh, little endian frames, which means that each chunk of sound, sound is stored as an integer, but you, it can also output a float. It can output a 32, bit, 32 bits and so on and so on. And obviously, the stream is not annotated. So it's kind of like a row byte stream, and you need to have an extra layer that remembers what is that. What is that. And then if you want to put this into encoder, it might happen that your encoder does not support particular combination of these parameters, so you have to convert that. Uh, and you cannot do this earlier than in runtime. Then. This conversion, if it happens, usually is lossy. So there are plenty of techniques that, and you can make a PhD only about that. You know how to do this with minimal loss of quality. Then, it's not end. Uh, it's hello world. Uh, then, if you, usually when you have encoder and decoder, you have like, ext you rely on, on native code. You are not, we are not going to re-implement MP3 decoder or encoder. And it has to be written in, in C because of the performance reasons. Uh, the, the, how, the, the, how authors design the APIs is, I mean, that it's kind of explosion of creativity, I would, I would call it like this. Like, uh, it's unbelievable how many design patterns you find in such simple um, cases. Um, and, and to make things worse, uh, these are, this is area where global state is st still, uh, you, you, you can still find the plenty of libraries using, being used in the wild where global state is, is cool. So, um, so it's not easy. Um, and then, if you have an Elixir app, it means that most of your, let's say that each of these components is, is a separate li uh, library. It means that most of your libraries will have native dependencies. And these dependencies will have their own dependencies. So it means that build system alone, that was one of the main challenges when we started, is complicated. In order, uh, on, on top of the regular uh, mix compiler stack, you, you need to have like a parallel native compiler stack that is capable of resolving dependencies of the native code and dependencies of these dependencies. And 
The problem is that it works differently on different platforms because, for instance, on Linux, you have this package config thing that for each package you install should provide you a simple command that allows you to ask for compiler flags to add while compiling or linking. But some libraries does, does not ship the config files for that. Or uh, if you are on Mac, you need to use brew and so on and so on. I, don't ask me about Windows. Uh, and there are many platforms and many compilers. Obviously, sometimes use Clang, sometimes use, use GCC, and sometimes use uh, Microsoft compilers if you are sh uh, shipping uh, for Windows, which is a, often the case when in the world of multi multimedia. This is area where you cannot forget about Windows. Um, so one of the biggest challenges we had from day one was to handle how to handle this because we found out that in Elixir or Erlang ecosystem there is no proper tool, tool for doing this. Like Rebar and all that stuff, it's, it's not sophisticated enough. Um, so that was Hello World, so let's think about the real life example. Where let's make an application that is supposed to make it like a TV stream from an event like this, where we uh, we, we have one, maybe one camera, but we might have uh, multiple cameras. We might want to overlay the uh, presentation over the, the video. We would, would might have multiple sources of audio and we would like to mix that independently from the video and so on and so on. And then we would like to stream that over the net. It means that we might have uh, uh, multiple clients uh, reading that, so we, we have all problems with scalability. If something fails on that side, which it should not interrupt uh, making the mix, uh, if, if one camera fails, we should be able to s uh, seamlessly continue making mix from the second camera, and so on and so on. This is what usually TV4 uh, buys these huge cars, you know? And if they make an event, you know, they, they drive with these physical cars with f tons of physical equipment. So if you were to replace that, um, uh, it becomes tricky um, on the archi architectural level. And ob obviously, if, you, if we can, we should use GPU for encoding. So as you can imagine, accessing GPU from Elixir or any other high-level language is not really a uh, nice thing to do. Um, so what can go wrong in, in such case? Um, first of all, we need to synchronize audio and video. Unless you, you know, you, you, it was like in the old TV, you know, that sometimes it was, it was good. But I, I imagine that we don't like it. Um, Inputs can fail randomly. We have different buffer types. So for instance, most probably when you capture audio, it will be stored as a binary. But if we, we have something from the uh, like GPU encoder, it will be stored as a pointer to the GPU memory. And we have to interoperate on this. Um, we have clock synchronization and time skew, which means that if I have a clock, uh, if I capture sound in my sound card in my computer, it has a clock that measure, measures the time and makes these frames of sound. And then I process this, send it to someone, and someone is streaming this on, on their computer, and they have another sound card that is playing this, and the sound card also has a clock. But these clocks are not synchronized. They are going to skew over time. Um, so uh, we would like to be able to dynamically reconfigure the pipeline. We would like to have a feedback from the network how many packets were lost so we can adjust the codec se settings so we can, let's say, reduce the bit rate when uh, the, 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 the bandwidth is low, and, uh, and so on and so on. So uh, the domain is, is, um, is extremely complex, and you need to be like a full stack developer from day one in order to handle this. And uh, the, the aim for Membrane is to, to kind of hide a lot of this from you. So how to do this uh, and stay sane? Um, and uh, speaking more professionally, how to maintain proper uh, throat foot of the, de the developer team, right? Because that was the problem. When I was building the first version of RadioKit, I referred to another framework that uh, is much more mature. Uh, and I'm going to talk about this a bit later. Um, and, but time for developing any feature, like any simple feature using it, was enormous. You know, that was unacceptable in terms of the, of the business. You know? so, so one thing is well, how to hide all that, so at least when you want to uh, convert MP3 file to MP3 file, you don't know to know about all that. <laughs> uh, and secondly, how to maintain a proper uh, let's say, developer practices and, and how to uh, be able to code quickly. So 
first thing that uh, membrane, membrane brings is the abstraction, abstraction layer. And it is inspired by GStreamer. GStreamer, has anyone heard about GStreamer? Okay. So GStreamer, for these who, who hasn't heard, is a framework uh, who was, I think it's developed for 12 years already. It was uh, created uh, mostly for integration with uh, GNOME, you know, the, the desktop that you use when you use Linux or on Ubuntu by default. Uh, and there was time where there was no proper multimedia layer. So if you have the file and you wanted to play it and you double click the file, there was nothing that could automatically kind of understand what type of file it is and, and play it regardless of the codec being used and, 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 and so on. And they created GStreamer, which is really cool when it comes to idea. But honestly speaking, I think it's not as much cool when it comes to implementation. First of all, it was driven by desktop. So the primary purpose for GStreamer was to provide a multimedia, multimedia layer for graphical user interface. And there are certain consequences in design uh, by, uh, because of, this, of, that, of that fact. This, the second thing, which is more important for us as developers, is that it is based on glib. Glib is kind of a standard library for C that is used in G GTK+, which is a toolkit, uh, widgets toolkit for GNOME. And all family of, li of, of libraries that you use in this, in, this, in this graphical user interface. And it is a single threaded uh, um, library that provides you a, a very simple event loop, which means that essentially uh, if one operation that is supposed to be asynchronous blocks, everything blocks. So as you can imagine, this does not, it doesn't scale. And uh, there are many more pr problems with that. Like internally, it's based on poll. So, you know, it's, it's even if you write a software that does not block, you know, it's not going to handle multiple connections and so on and so on. It was just not built for that purpose. And GStreamer itself has certain threading model that is kind of not using this, this main loop, but uh, I've observed many times in the wild uh, uh, applications that are deadlocking. Uh, it's really hard to debug. Uh, there are no proper inspection tools. You know, you, you can forget about all the cool ones we have in Elixir. So, uh, but we really appreciate how they created the abstract abstraction layer. So what we did in Membrane is based on, on GStreamer in terms of concepts. And for those of you who do does not know how it works, um, short introduction. Like we have this uh, simple Hello World pipeline and indeed it is called pipeline. This, this whole thing is called pipeline. And Pump pipeline con consists of elements. And elements can be either source, filter, or sync. Filter is something that eats data and outputs data. Uh, source is just outputting data. Uh, sync is just uh, eating data. Um, so example of source can be file source. So element that reads a file. Or uh, HTTP source. So something that fetches a file from the, from the net. Or sound card source. Uh, that's something that captures the sound from the sound cards. Uh, uh, example of, of filter is a decoder, so MP3 decoder, like, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, any video decoder, or uh, H.264 decoder, or um, uh, element that is capable of measuring the audio level, or making it louder or more silent, or uh, something that is capable of resizing the, the video stream that, that, that is going through it, and so on. Uh, sync is the reverse of source, so this is something that can store it to the file, you can send it somewhere, and so on and so on. So these are elements, and the whole point is that if you have an input, uh, let's say HTTP input or file input, uh, it works the same. Like for, from the standpoint of the rest of the pipeline, the rest of the pipeline don't care what is at the beginning, because we provide certain uniform interface to connect these elements together. And these, these, connect, these connectors are called pads. Uh, and the pads are these dots on the, on the, on the picture. Uh, because depending on type of the element, they, have, they might have multiple combinations of pads. For, ex for instance, on this um, uh, picture, we have an OGG demuxer, which means that if you have a file with this OGG extension, it can contain multiple streams. It can contain audio and video and we need to have a separate decoder for both. So 
For instance, uh, we have element that takes one input, but can output two things. But we cannot predict uh, earlier than in runtime how many of them will be, because the format allows to have only video, only audio, audio and video, audio and video and metadata. You know, there are multiple combinations. So uh, I'm not going to go into details, but because this presentation is too short, but generally speaking, these parts can be static, so they are predefined. They can be dynamic, so they are created in runtime, or they can be appearing if, let's say, decoder finds that there is a new stream in the, in the byte stream. Uh, another important thing is that they can be pull or, or push. So uh, one pull is something like that you know from a uh, gen stage, like so, so the, the, f f the element that is later in the pipeline ask the, the element that is earlier for data. But there are some elements that are pushed, they arrive. So for instance, if you have UDP socket and it receives a frame, it pushed that immediately. Uh, and we need to kind of uh, connect that all together. Uh, another thing things are cups. So each pod has a set of cups that it can handle. So we know that, for instance, OGG the Muxer expects OGG stream. So if we try to push the, uh, the MP3, MP3 file, it's not going to work. So when we do the, this connection, we annotate the byte stream, the buffers that are flowing between the elements. So uh, the framework can control if we are not trying to connect incom incompatible uh, elements. And then we have buffers, data flow as buffers. Uh, so data flows between pods. So if we have two pods into elements, we can link them and then the data can flow between them as buffers, which are just chunks of data. And the problem here is that buffers can have different memory types. So we might have a buffer stored as a binary, uh, or we might have a pointer to GPU, or we might have a pointer to like a regular uh, memory. Uh, and we need to convert uh, between that. Obviously, we have to avoid these conversions as much as we can, but sometimes we have to. Um, another thing is that we have events. So for instance, if the, the file is a reading uh, file and it reaches the end, it can send the event that is end of stream. And the events are aligned with buffers. So you, know, you, you, you can be sure that arrive in order. So for instance, if the, in this case, this, is, this uh, the diagram represents copying a file. So for instance, if the file sync can be implemented in such a way that it, it, as long as it receives buffers, it stores them to the file. But if it receives an end of stream event, it closes the file. And, um, and it's similar. Like you, you can use this abstraction for many other, uh, many other elements, even if they are not files. Or, um, uh, for instance, if the, it wasn't a file sync, but it was a, a TCP socket, you can use it f to close a TCP socket, right? And you do not care who was the, what was the origin of this end of stream. You, you don't need to. Uh, the, the, the sync don't, does not have to be aware of what was the source. And another thing are notifications. So these are messages that are being sent, but they don't have to be aligned with the byte stream. So for instance, we might have an element that is measuring the sound level. So you, it can show like in the audio player, you know, that it is either loud or, 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 or quiet. And it's post, it sends the messages to some handler that is displaying this in the UI or I don't know, does whatever. But these uh, notifications does not have to be aligned with the byte stream. Actually, they are often pre-computed based on multiple buffers. So so, uh, um, so they are kind of independent. Another thing that membrane does uh, is that it has core. Core, essentially, the, the role of core is to do everything that was mentioned in the previous slide as what can go wrong. So this is the the part of, of code that uh, implements. Uh, life cycle of elements and pipelines, so starting, stopping, pausing, uh, uh, clean up, and all the stuff. Um, this is the thing that is uh, responsible for creating uh, actual processes and supervision trees, because in Membrane, each pipeline is a process, each element is a process, and so on and so on. So we don't have to manage this manually. We create a definition of the pipeline, and it does this for us. Um, it provides some error handling mechanism. So, so if uh, let's say the data is malformed and the element is uh, communicating that something w went wrong, it knows that it has to shut down the whole pipeline and stuff like this. Uh, it allows the, it provides ability to link elements and check whether they're compatible, implements back pressure, uh, 
It is going to implement soon uh, audio video synchronization. It's going to implement soon clock synchronization, so we don't have this issue with time, time skew. Uh, it provides quite a robust uh, logging mechanism because we, we could not rely on the built-in uh, logger because it was uh, too weak for us. Uh, it, it pro it's going to provide quite advanced options for uh, inspecting the state of the pipeline. So we can imagine that in some version that we'll be able to have a, a kind of observer that is showing the, the diagram of the pipeline and you can see right real time you know, how it changes. Um, and it's going to handle different buffer types. So if there is one element that talks to GPU and another that talks to as bits uh, binary, it's going to uh, transparently convert that. Uh, and there are like many, many, many more, more features. And another thing is that we have plenty of supplementary libraries. I'm going to mention only two of them. Uh, one is called Bundlex, and Bundlex is this thing that is going to handle all the native code dependencies. Uh, and it's extracted, so you can use for any other project. Uh, and we have Unifex, which is an abstraction layer over C code, because we would like to achieve a state where we write a one, uh, one piece of C code in C, and then depending, depending on the context, we can either run it as NIF or as a C node. Because sometimes you would like for increased reliability, we would like to spawn it as a separate process. Uh, and you know, in re when you write the NIF, you know there, there is a tons of boilerplate. Boilerplate. So Unifex essentially allows you to, to hide all this and and uh, compile the same code uh, in multiple ways. Um, maybe some code sample. Uh, after all, this is a, a conference for developer. Uh, when you would like to make a pipeline, you, you just uh, create a model. Uh, model has to use membrane pipeline. Uh, there are like tons of macros that does magic, and and what you have to do, you have to implement set of handler, uh, set of callbacks. Like so, the interface is uh, very similar to Gen Server. If you know how to use Gen Server, you are going to be able to use this, and uh, you define set of children. Uh, so it, it is a bit similar to how do you s do supervisor specification. Uh, so. We define uh, that there will be source that is a uh, that is a, a element called file source. Uh, it might have some parameters: the decoder, encoder, and sync. And then you define links. So how all these things are linked together? This this setup is very simple. This is really like a linear pipeline, but obviously that might be super sophisticated. Um, and then you just do some specification out of it, and that's it. So, <laughs> so th this is an attempt to um, to to make a, a framework that allows you to think about this. Forget about all this mess I've, be I've been mentioning uh, previously, and write a code that is more or less similar. That is really straightforward to write. Uh, and this is what Membrane does. There is a similar API for elements. So if you want to create a new element, there is a, like, a, you create a model, you have to uh, use something, uh, then you have to implement a few callbacks. That's it, you know? Uh, and all this complexity is hidden. Um, so essentially, this is Membrane. Uh, the use case, uh, for, for instance, is that we have a service where you can upload files. Uh, this is kind of a dedicated Dropbox for, for radio. And while Phoenix is ca taking the, the data from the, from the browser, you can process, is, process this uh, in real time, right? So uh, we are transcoding all files that are being uploaded by the user, so we can ensure that files being stored in the system are in the same format. And we can do this uh, like while they're uploaded, right? And you can, we can really easily embed that uh, into, into Phoenix application, right? Because we create a super simple pipeline where we feed what we got from, from, uh, from Phoenix and output we put to storage and that's it, you know? So normally, previously we had to write a separate app in Gstreamer that was a separate process with a separate build system with a separate language and separate risk everything and spawn it as a su sub process, which is also not very efficient when, it tam when, it, when you try to scale. And now we can do this just directly in, uh, uh, in Elixir and this is the simplest uh, example uh, I can imagine for this. Uh, obviously, you can imagine replacing uh, 
uh, a, a radio studio or a this a TV set, you know, for mixing using, uh, well, maybe a bit more complicated definition, but um, still hiding a lot of complexity from you. Um, and hopefully uh, you find this useful. Um, this is how we spawn it. So it's very, we, we try to, we try to f uh, fit into OTP patterns. So we are not trying to reinvent the well in that case. Um, and that should work. Uh, where to find more information? Uh, here are several links. Um, be free to ask me whenever you want on the conference or later on. Um, and that's it. If you have any questions, I'm here and I'm not disappearing from the conference. So the question was, what, do they see any other context than the radio for this? Yes, for instance, we've been uh, recently in the, the software, in software mention, I mean the consult I'm running right now, uh, we, we do quite a lot of multimedia. And for instance, uh, before FaceTime implemented the, this group video chat, we, got a, we, we were building this for, for Silicon Valley startup that was doing an app that was capable of doing uh, multiple, like I think up to 16 or 22 people video chat rooms. Uh, and Membrane was too uh, young then for this. I think still it might be a bit too young, but uh, that is a perfect use case, you know, because then you have to handle a lot of networking stuff. Uh, you have to uh, do some pre-mixing, you know, so, you know, you don't expect every device to do the uh, composition. And then you need to have something that is going through. One of the clients we're talking uh, uh, with now is a company that has a turn servers. So the servers you use when you use WebRTC and you have two clients that cannot talk directly. So you have to route the traffic through the server and he wants to embed membrane there so he can do some processing while the traffic goes. So th these are cases. Exactly the use case. So the question was, uh, or, or had you finished? Yeah? Yeah, yeah okay. So the, 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 the case was that there is an application that is uh, feeding a lot of um, video streams and, and then uh, do some uh, like machine learning on this, right? And before we do this, we would like to process the video somehow, for instance, making black and white. Yes, this is exactly the case of membrane. So you can have the, this layer that is feeding the, the streams, that is pre-processing them, and then you might have your custom element. So when you, because I assume that if your client is paying you for uh, making this app, uh, they are not interested in paying for generic things like feeding the, the stream, right? They are interested in this machine learning stuff. So essentially that means that you can take ready elements that are doing all the work like feeding, uh, transcoding, uh, resizing, uh, making black and white and so on. Currently not all of, all of them are done because video was added to membrane later, but, but it's doable. And then you focus only on writing your custom element that implements your custom business logic and this element can be proprietor, proprietary. Yes. Yes, I mean that the architecture is very similar to GStreamer. We are younger than GStreamer, so plenty of things are not implemented yet or are in progress and so on. What, what is important? If uh, there is one thing that we are not aiming at and GStreamer will be always better, it's, uh, it's the performance. Because you, know, you never can compare the Elixir app that is dealing with tons of data like this one with a pure C code. But this is not the case for us. In, in the, like nowadays, given how cheap is the infrastructure, you know, it's easier to, uh, to, 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 to make more instances. And the, we believe that benefits of having that high, uh, written on higher level are, uh, are bigger than cost of, of, uh, of lost performance. Uh, but, but I have to say that this is the limitation, but we are not aiming at, at competing with that uh, on this area in this streamer. This is actually what makes us distinct. Um, 
so yeah, but essentially you can do whatever you can do in GStreamer and more because uh, because thanks to seamless integration with Elixir and all the the the, pat the design patterns we have and for instance embedding this into app that has a web server and having uh, I don't know WebSocket API that dynamic dynamically controls the pipeline and so on it's much more easier to implement than when you had uh, like an external entity written in a separate technology and you have to create a cer set certain internal API to, to integrate that and it becomes quickly uh, a mess to maintain. Uh, there is no like like you, you can really make this you know it's really different it, it's like it, it really depends on what you do with this uh, with the with the with the data like you know you can't compare the case where you uh, transcode it on GPU with uh, where the most uh, uh, performance loss will be from pushing buffers from one memory to another to case where you do operations purely in Elixir because there are plenty of elements that do not touch native code at all. So obviously they will be slower, but there, are, there, is, a, so there is a certain trade-off, you know? It's not for everything. We do not make, aim to, to make framework for everything. But the case like you mentioned, perfect case. Any more questions? No? Um, so you're getting all these streams and you're dealing with all these limits. Is there something in the framework that helps you remove those bugs? You know, you saw that happen with the test bugs and you can probably say it's not happening with the first one. Um, but let's say we don't put a, the question was do we have any constraints in the framework regarding amount of data we can process? No, I mean that as much the the machine and the virtual machine can handle, we, we, we you know, it's up to you, you know, to kind of test where is the limit. Um, we do not make any artificial constraints in, uh, when it comes to this. There is no reason to do so. Right. Uh, I mean that if for any reason your application needs to be constrained because for instance for any reason let's say you have an application that where you limit amount of concurrent listeners right and but this is a business case this is something that should be implemented by a developer using membrane not us we might maybe provide an element that uh, gives you some generic way to do this but you know we are not going to limit the 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 the, 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 the framework in any way so as much as your hardware can do, you can do. All right, thanks. Okay, thank you.